This week on the agenda, agricultural anger. Just why are thousands of farmers taking to the streets in protest across Europe? Protests by farmers have been sweeping Europe for months. Tractors have dramatically blockaded cities in France, Germany, Italy, Greece, Hungary, Romania and more in a show of fury and frustration at EU policies that farmers say threaten their livelihoods. Everything costs more for farmers now. They're hit with higher energy, fertiliser and transport costs. At the same time, some governments and supermarkets have reduced food prices to help consumers deal with the cost of living crisis. The EU waived duties on cheap agricultural imports from Ukraine, which depressed prices and caused deep resentment. There's also increasing alarm over the EU's farm-to-fork strategy at the heart of its Green Deal aimed at making the bloc climate neutral by 2050. Agriculture in the EU is responsible for 11% of CO2 emissions, but farmers are also victims of the impacts of climate change and extreme weather. So does climate policy need to be more farmer friendly? Or does the already subsidised agricultural sector need to embrace the fast pace of change needed to protect the planet? Joining me now is Christiana Lambert, the president of COPPA, which represents more than 22 million farmers across Europe, and Patrick Schroeder, senior research fellow at the Environment and Society Centre at Chatham House. Thank you both for, for coming on the agenda. Christiana, let me start with you, because this is a really fast-changing story. Um, French farmers called off protests for now um, because, well, in response to some government um, concessions. But let's talk about the background, the charges that national governments are failing to support their farmers on top of the European Union imposing burdensome regulations. So does this all go back to the Green Deal of 2019 to decarbonise and digitalise Europe's economy? No, I think uh, there are several problems. We had uh, multiple crises since uh, 2020, uh, COVID, COVID crisis, uh, uh, war in Ukraine, inflation, uh, energy cost, and then uh, the problem with the climate, with uh, many very difficult uh, frost, droughts, and uh, it's very difficult for farmers. And uh, now, what is very important for the farmers is that uh, with the uh, Ukraine war, there is a difficult with the price of the products. For example, for the wheat, it's a wind zone why also in uh, Polish, Romania, Bulgaria, Farmers are very busy, and uh, it's not uh, the Green Deal for the decision now, but uh, all those uh, new tax, 27 tax in the Green Deal and in Farm to Fork, and farmers are afraid, they have no visibility, so it's the reason why they are very busy and they want to tell it, and also perhaps a lack of uh, recognition. So, Christiana, let, let's talk about that, that sense of threat that, that farmers um, feel. I, is it the case, do you think, that Brussels simply doesn't understand the problems that they have? The problem is that uh, they feel that like Brussels, as you say, doesn't listen to uh, them. With the uh, Green Deal in uh, 2020, it was uh, thought uh, before the multiple crisis. And the problem is that uh, the context is now different, but uh, Brussels and essentially the Commission wanted to go on uh, business as usual. They didn't uh, change anything. But Patrick, I mean, at the same time, we could say that, you know, a key problem here is that agriculture is a huge contributor to carbon emissions, which have to be cut. And after all, we, we've just had the hottest January on record, haven't we? Um, the World Meteorological Organization confirmed that uh, not only Europe, but the world had the warmest January on record. It was uh, 0 0.7 degrees above the um, average of the last three decades. So this is um, a cause for concern. Um, and yeah, as you said, agriculture is a significant contributor to climate change and emissions from, from agriculture need to be reduced. Uh, European farming accounts for about 11% um, of EU emissions. 
But at the same time, agriculture is also being impacted by climate change. So it's affecting water reservoirs. And if we remember in Greece, uh, wildfires last year wiped out about 20% of farm revenue. And um, being said that, farmers are not oblivious to climate change. They often know best um, about the impact that climate change is having on agricultural practices. And then they also know about the possible solutions. And then again, about the questions that you had there, how farmers, um, it's also important to mention that farmers are feeling squeezed economically as uh, small businesses. They're feeling pressure by a big agribusiness to reduce their prices, while at the same time their costs are increasing, including fuel price costs uh, due to fuel, fuel price inflation. So they are, their businesses face increasingly disruptive and costly weather events. And on top of that, they're now being told that they have to farm in different, more costly ways. So yes, um, farming has to change due to climate change, um, but farmers also need to be able to make a profit and believe that they have a future. But Christiana, some would say that many European farmers are being paid huge subsidies for, for exactly those reasons and um, for what are essentially unsustainable practices in the longer term. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? Uh, it's wrong saying that uh, we have uh, unsustainable practices. Farmers are working very hard since many years to improve uh, their practice. Uh, about carbon, about welfare, about uh, fertilizer, about breeding, about pesticide. We have, uh, in some countries, very good results. But the problem is that uh, NGO and sometimes the uh, Green Party only see the problem and only speak of the problem. I think what uh, was said by uh, Mr. Schroeder is very important. To change and to make the transition, we need to have better prices. But who will pay? The consumer doesn't want to pay. And the, our subsidies are really necessary. In Europe, we have very high level rules to produce. And we import many produce from other countries who, doesn't re who don't respect at all the same rules. Patrick, do, do you agree with that? And I, and I wonder too, what parallels we, we might be able to draw there with other sectors, other sectors like energy, which are also facing green transition and being pulled in all these different directions at the same time? There are indeed um, strong parallels with the energy transition. Um, in fact, the, um, the farmer protests we saw in Germany um, were to a large degree protests against the removal of tax breaks for diesel fuel that is used in the agricultural sector. So it shows how agriculture and, and energy are, are connected. And so diesel in Germany is taxed with around 40 cent, 47 cent per litre. And in the past, uh, farmers were able to get a tax rebate of about 21 cent per litre. So now due to, to the protests, um, this tax break on diesel will will be only be phased out in, in steps until 2026 and not um, in one go. It was originally planned uh, before the protest. But then in France, so the plans to gradually reduce um, the subsidies on agriculture, these were dropped completely, um, which is also not a good outcome. <clears throat> but then another parallel to the energy sector is that more and better coordination is needed between politicians, uh, industry representatives and farmers. and there's something from the energy sector that we could maybe look at and this is the uh, just transition mechanism that was set up a few years ago which also has a, a dedicated just transition fund to support regions across europe who are most affected by um, the net zero transition and so something similar like that could also be uh, practical uh, for the agricultural sector in europe do you worry, Christine, that, that fingers are being pointed and that the, that the farmers are being um, blamed for the economic malaise of Europe, if you like, and maybe also being made the, the, the scapegoats of climate change? Too often, farmers are in, uh, under accusation and are criticised from uh, different uh, political, uh, citizen, media, uh, but in fact, uh, uh, farmers are in the solution. Of course, we have a responsibility, 11%, okay? Uh, only 11%, but we produce food. We, we, we are in all the territories, and uh, we can also keep carbon in the soil. 
We can produce biomass for the fuel. We can produce uh, bioeconomy. Agriculture is much more in the solution. So it's too easy to make us uh, uh, scapegoats, as you say. And it's very difficult uh, for the farmer to listen to that. And uh, we need to say, and it's what COPA is really making, all what agriculture brings to society, bring to territories, and also, since Ukraine war, everybody sees that uh, food is strategic. Farming is a food security issue then. And, and Patrick, it, it, this really plays into the European elections that, that, that we, we have coming up this year. And, and I'm looking at some of these parties, you know, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, um, Rassemblement National in France, the Sweden Democrats, Fidesz in Hungary, the Brothers of Italy, the Dutch far right, I can't go on. Do you think that angry farmers are being exploited by the far right? Um, I mean, it's fair to say that there was a number of far right political groups that have tried capitalizing on the farmers' protest, especially through targeted social media campaigns. And as you said, this already points towards the elections coming up uh, later this year. And um, yeah, agriculture is always an election issue uh, for Europe, not only because it's such a, share, a large share of the European budget, um, but if we look at this, so farming communities might generally be more conservative, but actually in most cases they're not aligned with far-right ideologies. And we've seen also that the German Farmer Association has clearly distanced itself from, from AfD and far-right groups who have tried to influence and hijack the protests. Um, in this context, it's also important to note that um, far-right groups do not really have farms' interests at heart. Now, they probably even know less also about the practical solutions that are needed to achieve sustainable food systems transformation and uh, how it links to climate change. So it does get quite murky, doesn't it, Christiana? That there is a, a lot of, of tension in the industry and uncertainty um, about the future um, of farming. Why do you think that farmers aren't getting a fair deal? I would like to say after Mr. Schroeder that uh, what is important to note is also that uh, people sustain farmer protest. In all the country, we have 80%, uh, 85% people who say we are with the farmers. It's good. And why do, 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 the, do the society say that? I think it's because uh, they, they, they begin meaning that uh, no future, no food, as he said. Uh, food is really very important, but for many years they have uh, they have tried to buy less and less expensive, better food, less expensive. For the farmers, it's impossible to say, so to to accept. What we must explain is that to have good food, we need prices. We have sustainable agriculture in Europe, the best standard of sustainable agriculture and food in European Union in Europe. So. We need to. We need good prices. We are. We have high cost production because of environment, because of sanitary, because of labeling, because of many things, and they can um, want a very high target in Europe and by produce who don't respect anything from other country. It's uh, uncurrent. It is very difficult to understand for for the farmers. So, Patrick, I wonder what, what you think about that and, and why there's so much dissatisfaction with, with policymaking at EU, EU level. It seems that there's a, a disconnect here. Yes, there's dissatisfaction um, with the EU level policy making. Um, this is not necessarily a new criticism. Um, I mean, policymakers are often seen as being too detached from what's happening on the ground. Um, that Brussels is creating too much bureaucracy, um, that regulations are impractical, uh, etc. And, and many of this is, is, is probably true. Um, but at the same time, we also need to recognize that policymakers in Brussels have a very important role in setting long term targets, high level directions, um, not only for the agricultural sector, but uh, the European economy as a whole also needs to coordinate different objectives between different sectors, as well as um, trying to meet uh, climate targets. Now, um, as a result, what we've seen now, the European Commission has reacted and dropped some key passages in the proposal for a new 2040 goal for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 
including agriculture to reduce non-CO2 emissions by 30% in the next 25 years. So that's actually not a really good development um, and, and to some degree only postpones some difficult decisions that have to be made. Well, Christiana, you, you talk a lot about farmers needing those prices, it being so important. What hope is there, do you think, for, for those farmers faced with rising prices, with low wages, the EU's environmental <coughs> regulation and increased competition in the local food industry more generally? Of course, it's uh, very difficult as there is not a single or easy answer. Um, we have uh, an agricultural policy in Europe uh, who was uh, promoted to have uh, food enough and then to have environment and then to have territories and then to have uh, safety, labelling. Farmers are, uh, have been responding, OK, we have made all that. Now we have uh, new challenges. Of course, we can uh, uh, be present. We can say, OK, we can make the green transition. But uh, we, we need uh, to have an agenda, to have uh, realist and uh, realistic targets, to have a uh, uh, science-based decision. It's not the, the way the policies are making now. And also to have coherence with the uh, uh, trade decision. But there is another topic very important, it's Ukraine war. When the decision was taken to uh, accept the import from Ukraine without tax, it was for several months. But uh, war is going on, two years. And now if we have problem in some uh, production, crops, oleoseed, eggs, poultry, it's because Ukraine produce are coming in Europe without the same rules and without tax. Patrick, what do you think? Is there a way to, to keep everyone happy? Because environmental degradation is clear and present. I mean, is there a way to make the sustainable transition more, more inclusive, um, more effective, more equitable? Yes, that's definitely possible and also uh, necessary. Um, and we see that just transition uh, principles um, uh, already applied in the energy transition, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, so there are in, 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 uh, specifically two principles. One is a principle on procedural justice and the other one on distributive justice. And that sounds very theoretical, but in practice that means for procedural justice just means providing a seat at the table for farmers when policy decisions are being made rather than informing farmers afterwards when these decisions have been made. So that's then when um, there's resistance and you get um, backlash. Um, the other one about the distributional aspects of the transition, this is again comes to the costs and also the, the right prices. So it's important to ensure that the costs are not disproportionately carried by specific agricultural communities uh, or small farmers, but this needs to be something that carried by society as a whole. So I'm, I'm quite confident that if we do this in a just and participatory way, um, uh, it can be done. Um, uh, and without uh, not doing it, we'll reduce the effectiveness and then we lose further time to address climate change, but also move to the better uh, and sustainable food system that we all want. Christiana, as a farmer yourself and as a representative of the European <coughs> farming communities, do, do you think that kind of sustainable transition could work, would work? Of course, we need to make the transition. All the sectors need to make the transition. We have not planet B. So it's possible if uh, we have a science-based decision understood by the actors, if it's possible to have new technology, new science, digital tools, and the farmers are ready to do that, but they must be much more considerated. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen said we must stop the polarization. Okay, of course we must stop. Agriculture are too often victim of uh, very bad uh, critis criticize, and uh, we need to be understood, and we are working very hard every day, uh, essentially with uh, the animals, and it's necessary to have a new deal, a new green deal with the farmer and not against the farmers. Transition will go with the farmer, not against the farmers. That's really what I hope. 
Christiana Lampert, Patrick Schroeder, thank you both very much. Still to come here on the agenda, we'll look beyond Europe at the issues facing farmers across the globe with the head of the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development. We are all connected. Across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. While farmers in Europe are taking to the streets in protest, those in the Global South too are facing real issues over the questions of sustainability and food security, as well as a widening gap between North and South. At the recent World Economic Forum in Davos, I spoke to the head of the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, Alvaro Lario. Well, we very much focus on small-scale farmers on that last 10 mile all over the world. And it's true that we are seeing a lot of the countries sometimes going with uh, specific bilateral initiatives, but still we very much focus on multilateralism. I think China is also trying to, to play its part, like many of the other, uh, I would say, medium and, and high in countries. And we just saw it at COP28. There was an inner focus area, which is sustainable agriculture, small scale farming. We saw a leader's declaration of 160 countries and heads of state who came together. And I think that's the type of initiatives we want to see on sustainable agriculture, on climate action, how we can actually come together. So our message is also that multilateralism is still there. It's a way to really address many of the global public challenges. And one of them for sure is climate change. So that's no escape for any country. We will be all affected by it. You mentioned multilateralism, and that's something that Premier Li Chang brought up in, in his speech here at Davos. But he said it had to come with global rules. What do you make of that? Well, I think in our case, in the case of agriculture, it's very clear that the reality is that the World Trade Organization, there hasn't been any major advances for the last two, three decades. So I know in Gossi, the leader, the, the, the DG is right now looking at how, what could be the conversation? How can we really get that, st that stuck moment that we are in to really move forward and make sure that we are addressing some of the global challenge in terms of poverty at the same time as we are being fair in that transition that we are currently having in terms of food system because climate change will remain. So it's very complex, but we need fora, like for example, the World Trade Organization, where many of these issues are being discussed. But of course, your goal is to eradicate poverty, to er eradicate hunger. Um, it's no mean feat, is it? So what right now would you say are the biggest impediments to that? Well, China is a very good example of how he, they managed to eradicate poverty. And what we're seeing still is that a lot of countries don't focus enough on local production, on giving the small scale farmers access to finance, access to water, access to credit, really land ownership. And one of the impacts we're seeing after the Ukraine war is actually that many countries are realizing how vulnerable they are to external shocks. So not focusing on monocultures, trying to diversify crops, trying to make sure that you have a minimum local production, integration of regional markets, that continues to be I think, at the forefront of our work. And it's also getting to the minds of the heads of state that this can be actually a big threat to security. So food security starts sometimes to be also national security. So the conversation needs to be happening at all levels and with those small scale farmers to, to start with. Uh, look, you, we were talking about poverty. You were talking about how China ha has pulled so many people um, and made out of poverty and made huge, huge progress. The theme of this summit is trust. I mean, do you think that the rest of the world needs to trust China more? Well, we need to see places where we can all come together, that we actually have common challenges. One of the biggest common challenge, very clearly, is climate change. And on that one, it will affect all countries. We are seeing it in the developed world, we are seeing the developing economies, but also, for example, how food is produced. That's very much what happens in one part of the world or one climate shock will affect other parts of the world. So that connection, we have to acknowledge it, that we are all interconnected. We cannot run away from that. And for that, we need dialogue. We need constructive, uh, I would say, uh, strategies 
among all countries. But what can the rest of the world learn from China? Who's doing it? Well, for China, I would say that they have been extremely successful. I remember when IFAD was there 30, 40 years ago, and the type of projects that they have been able to really uh, make people, hundreds of millions of people get out of poverty. And many of these projects is interesting. Now, for example, some of the aquaculture projects we had, now they're turning actually into tourism and they're trying to find new ways of adding value. So I think that's the next step in the development journey. And China has been very successful in that growing over these different journeys and steps. You're, you're making the case for investing in rural communities to improve global food security. But why hasn't that massive investment happened? That's a good uh, question. I would say that many times in many parts of the world it's seen as the elections come, you give food, you give seeds for free, but that's not a viable business model. What we need to make sure is that we attract rural SMEs, that jobs are created, that the farmers get a decent price out of what they're producing. Usually they get seven cents out of every dollar. So we need to make sure that that type of business, because farming is a business, is a viable business where people can get decent lives. If that's the case, whether it's in processing, in distributing, in storing, in transportation, in selling, all of those parts can create a lot of jobs. And that's what we are very much aiming to invest in. And here at Davos, partnering also with the biggest global agri-food businesses and the, with the big global value chains, how can we connect it to the local private sector? Because access to, to those things are really important, aren't, aren't they? Things like technology, things like financial services. Um, it, those, that access can be much more difficult in vulnerable parts of the world. So what are you doing to change that? For us, a big component is how can we be able to scale up our impact? So right now in the last three years, we managed to increase the income of 77 million small-scale farmers, increase the production of more than 60 million small-scale farmers, but we need to, de to do more. And for that, we need technology, we need access to credit, we need to make sure that they have the ecosystem to attract the private sector, and we work with governments to do that in almost 100 countries, but we need more. And we need to do more of what we know it works because we have the solutions there but we need to scale them up and to make sure that the financing flows into those solutions. So who's your ideal partner for that technology you need? Who is the ideal partner for that line of credit you talk about? Well, in the case of line of credit, usually we work with very much with the local banks, with the agriculture development banks, with the development banks in the countries and how we can mobilize more resources and access to credit to a lot of the small scale farmers. We have very interesting programs, for example, in the Sahel, which is a challenging area to operate in. We're with the development banks to try to provide almost for free uh, loans to small scale farmers for climate adaptation. We're talking about money, we're talking about that much needed investment and getting it to the, to, to the right places. So what's your take on the cost of living crisis? Is, is it going to get worse in 2024 or is it going to get better? Well, in the developed economies, we're seeing the food inflation, which is coming relatively down. But that's when we, the entire world pays attention, when the developed economies, and we all see it in our supermarkets, then when we are starting to ask questions, where is the food coming from? Where is the value chain? Why are the farmers getting paid? We're seeing demonstrations in Germany, in Netherlands, in many parts of the world. So actually, we need to solve these issues. We need to address them. They are political. They relate to trade. They relate to many issues, to where the financing is going. But there's no escape to it. I mean, it's clearly that food is a major part of us as human beings. And we know that people who are producing that food are going hungry in many of the developing economies. So it's just something that we need to address. And now I know that many leaders are looking into it because they're seeing the vulnerability of their countries to many of the food shops. So hopefully that's a, a way of bringing the attention. It's not the best, but clearly it's starting to become a very, very important topic. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, inside Africa, we speak to ministers from Nigeria, South Africa, Zambia and Ghana to assess the challenges facing the world's poorest continent. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.